World Wide Web. So mortgage rates are starting to come down and that is great news for those of us still surviving in this real estate game that we all know and love. And with the summer buying season at our doorstep, the question becomes, how do you plan to keep your business efficient and effective without losing the personal touch with your clients? Well, today we hope to provide that answer. Welcome to the Texas Real Estate and Finance Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Mills, a North Texas mortgage banker with Geneva Financial. And when I'm not rambling into this microphone, my team and I help you and your clients navigate the loan process like Tom Brady navigated his most recent Netflix roast. Nice and easy without breaking a sweat. Make We're making sure that your clients have a great experience and that you get eight more referrals out of the deal. Give us a try and we'll show you how to do it. Now, today's episode is all about how to take your real estate game to the next level using all the technology tools at your fingertips these days. Our world's changing rapidly with new regulations, new software systems, and AI becoming a bigger and bigger part of our daily lives. So how do you manage all of this without going insane, but keeping that close connection with your clients? Well, today we're going to show you some tools that are easily accessible and can change how you operate your business day to day. But before we start, if you um, if if today's episode gets a little something going in you and helps you take those next steps in your real estate skills, please share it with a friend. We keep chugging along each and every week, adding new listeners and more downloads, and you guys are a big reason why. So like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast with someone that you think would benefit from what we bring to you each and every week. I can't thank you guys enough for all the support, and we're just starting to see what a little community is capable of. So today... We welcome to the podcast a man with 35 years of experience in the real estate industry. He's a best-selling author, a best-selling author, the former CEO of Keller Williams that was integral in transforming Keller into the tech-focused real estate brokerage that it is today. He's been a licensed realtor for 35 years, so he knows what it's like to be in the trenches. And now he's the president of Austin-based Ojo and Mot Motivo. I knew I was going to mess it up as we go. Um, it's a real estate platform using the latest technology to revolutionize and manage your real estate business. And he's here to tell us all of his secrets. So please welcome to the podcast, Mr. Chris Heller. Hey, Chris. Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm doing awesome, man. How are you today? You're, you're, you're down there in Austin, Texas. I think it's, it's like it's becoming the uh, tech I hub love, of the world. We're, we're like uh, it's the new Texas, Silicon Valley. Right? Yeah, that, those buildings behind me uh, used to be, or is what used to be Rainy Street, which used to be a lot of, a lot of little old houses. Now it's skyscrapers. Yes, it's growing up massively, and it seems like, like I said, it's it's becoming like the tech capital of of the country, or at least it's developing into that. Is that did that play a bit of a role of you guys moving there? No, um, look, at the, we the company was founded here, um, and uh, and I think you know that was founded in 2016, and so it's really been. It, I think it's just a coincidence. This happened to be, be about that time where. You know, you saw not only all the Silicon Valley companies, but a lot of other companies uh, you know, build big operations here and some of them move their headquarters here. So it really has become like a, like a, a second, you know, Silicon Valley. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's exploded. And, you know, there's been obviously a ton of people moving there. And it's it's funny, you know, anytime I, I get on Twitter and I see the uh, the doomers of the real estate market talking about um, house prices crashing and, you know, everything falling, which is completely not the case. Um, they often use Austin as an example of this and they'll show Austin prices. And it's kind of, you know, it's one of those things where you go, OK, well, you can you can only have, you know, uh, a, a boom for such a period of time and prices skyrocket the way they did without having a bit of a correction. And especially when you're talking about homes, you know, they'll show a house that was listed for 2.6 million and now it's only down to 2 million. Like, oh my gosh, it's falling apart. I'm like, let's let's settle down a little bit and, and realize, you know, where you came from versus where you are because the prices have certainly adjusted, but they're not, uh, they're not crashing by any stretch of the imagination. No, we, and you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, things like in this market, things went up just at a crazy rate. And that's not sustainable. And there's always adjustments in markets and there's always cycles in markets. So yeah. Yeah. And you can't pick the biggest boom markets and say that those are the ones. Cause I mean, I, I don't, I can't think of another market in the country when you look at a city like Austin that exploded the way it did over the last three years. Yeah, I, I agree. All right. So um, tell us a little bit about your company. So we talked a little bit about this ahead of time before you got on and, and you've got kind of a web here of, of companies kind of, you know, bound together, but, Motovo, uh, Movoto, Movoto, I keep Movoto, saying that. Yeah. Movoto, there Movoto, there we go. Movoto is really the forward-facing uh, part for the consumer and the realtor. So, so tell us a little bit about what Movoto does and how um, these companies kind of lever each other and, and integrate. 
Yeah, so we, um, so Ojo is the parent company. We, in 2020, middle of 2020, of the the, uh, pandemic, we were crazy enough to uh, raise a bunch of money and and acquire Movoto.com. Movoto.com is a search portal that's been around for over a dozen years. They, um, at the time, and we're, and we've, we've, since 2020, built that to the fifth largest portal. So, you know, Zillow, Realtor, Homes, Redfin, and then Movoto is number five. So we we operate the fifth largest portal. It's the largest privately owned portal. All the others are public companies. And we take those consumers. They're looking, you know, to buy, sell, or or to, to some of them just looking for finance, financing help to refi or HELOCs. And we, then we introduce them to the, the appropriate service professional, mm-hmm. a real estate team, a real estate agent, a lender, uh, for them to get their their needs met, so uh, that's at a high level. That's what we do. At a detailed level, we could spend the rest of the day talking about. But it's, <laughs> but, you know, we partner with top producing real estate teams in every city. We have a, another platform specifically for solo agents, where we help them, you know, uh, increase their productivity significantly. And and we we do both of that with the the introduction of consumers that are looking to buy and sell homes. Now that company that integrates for the realtor side, that's called Lever, correct? Yeah, for that's for solo agents, for individual okay. agents. Um, uh, Lever is Lever is really a service platform where we take individual agents that they don't want to join a team, right? They don't want to give up their identity. They they probably aren't going to go build a team, um, right. but they want to do more, and and they either don't know how or they don't want to do the things they need to to be able to do more, and that's where we come in with Lever. We sort of take care of all those things so they have more time to spend with buyers and sellers. So we we handle their database, their CRM for them, their marketing, their transaction management, lead gen, and provide training so that they can, you know, we put all those pieces together and make sure they work very tightly. Their the campaigns are set up, the marketing makes sense, um, and, and handle that all for them so that they can just spend their time, you know, being in front of buyers and sellers. And when we do that, we usually see their productivity go up. So you've obviously been doing this for a long time. Um, you've been in the uh, real estate business for 35 years as an agent yourself, running a team, doing all this kind of thing. Um, the database aspect of what you guys do, I think, is a is a very important piece of uh, any agent's business. And I often think it, it kind of goes overlooked a little bit because, you know, Agents spend so much time of their day, you know, meeting people, going to events and functions and spending time with friends and and building their sphere and trying to get in front of people as often as possible that they lose because most people that are sales oriented, you know, we're, we're personal. We want to be amongst people. We want to be in the crowd. We don't want to sit at a computer and put in data in order for our, our management system to go out and, and, and market to those people. But can you speak a little bit to the importance of that? And why it is such a crucial piece, especially these days, um, when trying to you know build your clientele, add new people to your network, um, and use those kind of technology tools that can really kind of develop your business for the rest of your career. Yeah. So, as an agent, you're either just doing things by by chance, you know, by happenstance, like you know, friends and family, your neighbors, um, you know, some close associates that you help them with their real estate needs or you're, you're building and running a business. And when you build and run a business, it absolutely requires that you have a database of prospects. So past prospects and past clients, current prospects, people that you can be marketing to on a regular basis to become top of mind, to get referral and repeat business from. And so that is the key to, to any agent's business. It's the key to any insurance agent's business or yeah. a loan officer's business, right? It's, it's anyone in sales um, that is, you know, responsible for their own book of business has to be able to continually build that database and then effectively market to that database. Agents we see fall, they usually fall into, they're all across the spectrum, but the two ends of the extreme is what we often see where they, they either don't do anything with their database right. or they spend all their time, you know, monkeying with it and never actually doing business. And so, um, we don't want agents to do either one of those. We want them to, you know, if they're if they're part of Lever, we're going to set up for them. We're going to make sure it's set up the right way. We're going to make sure it's running the right way. And and then it's just on them to to do the things they need to do, which is to to have the interactions and to build the relationships. 
And all they have to do really is just put the information into the system, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, oftentimes it's, they have it in the system, but it's not organized. It's not categorized correctly. It's not tagged correctly. It's not sorted the right way. So we, the first thing we do is help them, help them do that. Get it. Right. Get it. Yeah, That's where like the training a, piece comes in that you guys provide yeah. for that, right? It's like a junk drawer. We come in and organize it for them. <laughs> and, then, yes. um, and then and then we make sure that they have you know, the appropriate marketing and all the assets they need to be able to, to be sending out the, the touches and, and effectively reaching out to people so that they start to see a return from from that that database and uh, you know start to get business and referrals from it. Now, um, I'm personally a big believer in systems and processes because I think that you know when you go about your day, if you have certain things built into your day that is something that you do on a consistent basis that you've kind of designed, you know, and kind of programmed, you know, your life essentially for a period of time, that you're much more likely to have success on completing those things. So, as a um, you know 35 year veteran doing this, having a team, what have you found? Um, what kind of systems or processes have you put in place with your agents to kind of help them make this a focus on developing their database? And really, because again, I, I strongly believe, I know it's not the strong part for everybody's, you know, strong suit everybody's world, but at the same time, it's so impactful, you know, in the long term of your real estate career that if you can really have a, a tight managed, you know, um, um, a, a database that you can effectively market to, it can really change and, and build a career for for your entire life. So what have you kind of seen with your team that you've kind of put in place to help, you know, drive? yeah, it's, it's like, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's critical to building something, right? If you want to just yeah. go through, you know, month to month, year to year and, you know, doing whatever comes your way or whatever you bump into, then, you know, you don't need, you don't need anything. But if you want to, if you want to, to get a dividend off the investment of time and energy, that means you have to be building something. And and the great news with, you know, with our business, with 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 mortgage business, with insurance business, almost anything that involves sales is that if you do it right, there is a momentum that you can build. It, there is a snowball effect where it can start to build on itself and gain momentum. Uh, but that means yes, you have to have great systems and processes, and and you should have them for everything. You yes. know there. There's I was speaking to a group of agents yesterday and you know, we're on the topic of, you know, there's <clears throat> everyone. The great equalizer is time. We, are, we all have the same amount of time in the day, days of the week, weeks of the month, months in a year. Right? We don't you know, no one no one's figured out a cheat code to have more. And if they, my, my saying is it's the most time is the most democratic thing on the planet because everybody gets exactly the same amount no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, so then the question becomes, OK, how do you become the most efficient? and the most effective with the amount of time you have or the amount yeah. of time you're going to spend. Efficiency is all about systems and processes. So what systems can you put into place to create more efficiency? What processes can you put in place to create more efficiencies? What can you do? Um, what decisions can you remove? So you're making fewer decisions and things are just starting to happen. Yeah. Uh, effectiveness is, is a different thing. Effectiveness is skills. Okay. How can I, you know, how can I be more skilled at my presentations? How can I be more skilled at my objection handling? How can I be more skilled in, in my sales techniques, my sales languages? And, and those are things that just help you, you know, get more hits given the finite number of at-bats you have. And right. so, you know, it's, it's the, you know, if we use a sports analogy or baseball analogy since we're in baseball season, I guess actually we're in, Baseball. We're in all the seasons right now. Yeah, we're in all the seasons right now, almost. Um, playoff. <laughs> so I got the map shirt on. We're in second round of playoffs. You know, we're up yeah. three to two. One more game. We get to the Western Conference Finals. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, watched a little bit last night. The, uh, you know, it's it's the the at bats are you are the opportunities we have to meet with buyers and sellers. You know, the processes are all the things that get us to that at bat. Right. right. It's the. It's the monthly touches that we have, the automation that we have going on to reach out to people, to solicit, um, you know, uh, engagement from them, to solicit referrals from them. And those are the things that, that you know, you want to really leverage technology for because technology does some of those things really, really well. Yeah. Well, and speaking of that, so, you know, you were... Uh you know, the CEO of uh, one of the largest uh, real estate brokerages in the country for a number of years over at Keller Williams. Um, and you played a pretty big role in kind of shifting them from the old world to the new world um, and, and really 
you know, starting to leverage technology within the brokerage, you know, uh, on a, on a you know, large scale. So um, what, tell me about that experience. What was it that you saw when you got there and then what did you start to implement and then see the fruit from, you know, once you kind of put a lot of those processes in place? Yeah. Well, when I got there, I was there to build Keller Williams globally, right? To go in other countries. And one of the first things, there, there are a lot of things that I had to solve for, um, you know, building companies in other countries. Yeah. But one of them was technology. Like, how are we going to deliver our, our, our value prop, you know, in another, another part of the world? Um, and how are we going to set up that partner in that country to be able to deliver the, the services and, and the tools that we had? And can't be done without technology. So I immediately realized that we were we were not prepared for that. In fact, the company itself, you know, had been around for 25 years at that time, um, over 25 years at that time. And um, actually, yeah, at that time, over 25 years, and had a lot of legacy systems, a lot of legacy technology. So the first thing we had to do was to, to modernize it. And, and to bring it. So I, um, as I became, as I switched roles from the president of the, of the worldwide division to the CEO of the company, uh, I brought in, I brought in people that, that really understood technology at a high level. I've been involved in real estate technology since 2000 when I, I had a technology company back then, but um, I'm not a technologist. I understand right. it. Um, you know, I'm not, not in, you understand yeah. the importance of it, but you're not exactly the one uh, coding up the, go, the system. Go yeah. code and build it. Or right. design. Well, um, but you know, it takes all kinds because the guy out there building the code, he doesn't exactly have the vision to see what it can do. He just knows what it actually does in that moment. Yeah. So, you know, hired in a lot of people, you know, chief innovation officer, chief product officer, uh, chief technology officer. We worked really hard to, uh, you know, sunset as many of the legacy systems as possible to connect the systems, to uh, uh, streamline things, to have a, a strong uh, data layer to be able to, you know, benefit from the data that we had and the data that we were aggregating. And then on top of that, then you can start to build things. And that's that's um, that's where the level we got to when when I left to pursue some other things. So the um, you know, it was it was out of it was necessity, things we needed to do. As also, it was, it was the right time, right? It was right. Yeah. Technology was really, especially in our industry, was really starting to advance at a, at a fast level. And the things that agents and brokerages did for for decades, um, you know, with with marginal improvements in technology, started advance very quickly. So. You know, we're able to do things and help agents do things to become a lot more efficient, a lot more effective. The things an agent can do now from a marketing standpoint, from a database management standpoint to, um, you know, building new relationships, to deepening the relationships they have um, all using technology is, you know, fantastic. Did you, when you were going through this transition, because, you know, we see this a lot, um, you know, on the mortgage side for sure. And then when I talk to agents every day, especially because I'm a, uh, I use AI a ton and um, I am a big proponent of it. And I try to help people show them how to use it in their business because, you know, it's, it's, it's going to change everything <laughs> really. Um, but, um, but there's always pushback. There's always, well, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get into that, or I, I don't have time to learn that, or this is the way I've always done it. Or, you know, that's my favorite. Well, this is how we've always done it. So we're going to keep doing it that way. When you were at Keller and you were trying to bring in these new systems and processes to what you guys were doing to scale it, what kind of pushback did you get? And then how do you, you know, how did you combat that? What was your, you know, how did you keep that from, from, permeating through everybody else because anytime change occurs there's always going to be those naysayers that that don't want any part of it and when you're trying to spur that along you got to keep that you know kind of minimize as much as possible yeah okay the um you're never going to find a leader in in any company in any industry and in, in any field that's going to that you're going to hear those words come out of their mouths uh, right. oh this is the way we've always done it or this way like those are those are the ones that become dinosaurs right, right. they aren't the ones that become it'll become, last very long yeah um so fortunately i had you know uh, an owner of the company in, in gary keller who does not think that way uh, yep. and was very uh you know growth 
has very much of a growth mindset and learning base as as am I. And so, and in you know seeing how technology was advancing and how it was impacting consumer behavior, um, and understanding that you know for a, a service provider you have to be able to at the very least keep up with consumer behavior, if not exceed be their behavior or their expectations. Because when when behavior changes and behavior um, you know, keeps growing, or you see how the direction of behavior is going along go along with that are expectations, right? Be, right? Before Amazon, we were taught, we were all completely fine buying something online and, you know, having to fill out all our information, right? My address, my billing address, my, right. my credit card information. Now we've, we've become spoiled. Right? Our expectations are you go to a site and you want to buy something and they ask you for all that stuff. You're like, I can't believe I got to fill all this in. I can't believe they don't have this. Like what, you know, why, why didn't Google just put it in there? Should they just put it in there? You have everything. Yeah. Just put it in yeah. there. And then, and then, cause we're so used to the, you know, being able to do that on Amazon. Right. So, yep. um, so our expectations as consumers keep, keep getting elevated based on how technology advances. And as service providers, you want to, you want to be able to keep up or exceed your consumer's expectations. If not your value proposition, is, is can be dramatically diminished. Well, and uh, from a realtor's point of view too, nowadays, especially because when involved in, you know, you're filling out contracts, you're doing seller's disclosures, you are, you know, gathering data from your clients uh, on many levels to make that process as simple and easy as possible is going to put you in another echelon of professionals compared to everybody else who, you know, you're having to sit there and fill out a form or do a Google doc or whatever. So what have you guys over at Movoto and in, in within the, um, uh, within your, your real estate portal, what have y'all built out to kind of help make that process easier? So that way the realtor can spend more time, you know, getting to know their clients and, and getting that personal touch versus all the technical need, needs that, that have to happen in any transaction to kind of speed that along. Yeah. So, um, we're lucky because we get to, we get to partner with the top teams in the country. We have uh, about 300 top teams that we're currently partnering with and, and growing. And these, when I say top teams, they're like the, the best of the best. Right. And these teams have already figured that out, right? That's part of how they became who they are. Right. On the individual agent side, those individual agents are either dependent upon their broker providing all those things, which is really hard for a brokerage to do. Um, Especially these days. And, and quite frankly, I don't know if that is what they should be trying to do or they have to figure it out on their own. And that's where our, our like our lever platform is so appealing to agents, to individual agents, because if they don't want to figure it out on their own or they don't like doing it or they can't do it and they don't want to go join a team or or build a team, you know, we help them do those. Like we in those five areas of their database, their training, their their leads, their transactions um and their marketing left out in the fifth one um you know when we're helping them with all those five areas that really frees them up a lot to where they then can spend their time you know building uh, new relationships or deepening the ones they have or hopefully both uh so that they have a business that's actually growing from year to year do you feel like uh, Lever's been able to, I mean, is the transaction coordinator a necessity any longer with, with a lot of this stuff that's been innovated? Or do you think that that, that role is still still has a purpose in today's transactions? There's there's a lot of things that, that we leverage automation for in our, in our mm -hmm. industry. Um, there's certain things that still take the human touch. You know, you, it still takes... Uh, it still takes a human to be able to to talk to a buyer, for example, about the the repair requests and and you know what they should ask for, what they could ask for, or to help them negotiate those those aspects with the seller, or to keep things in perspective so that you know people don't get positional or um, judgmental about the other party, and then all of a sudden they're they're not moving forward when they really sh should be because they've an incredible yeah. personal transaction and a lot of yeah. personal feelings get involved yeah. with it on a regular basis. So yes. Yeah. So especially during the transaction, right? That's when, you know, emotions and, and stress are at their highest levels. So having, having people involved in those areas or areas that I don't, I don't see that changing. Um, I don't see it changing anytime soon. No. I'm not going to say it's never going to change, but not, not soon. I think where, where you'll see, um, you know, being able to use machine learning or artificial intelligence to 
um, to analyze documents and to complete documents and to um, more automate the process of, of who's getting what when and making sure it's being done on time and things aren't falling through the crack, we'll continue to, to see uh, those things happen. And, and those are all good things and positive things. So speaking of that, how much are you, how much have you guys worked in AI into, or either just the basic machine learning or the, um, uh, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for the, the chat bots, you know, how have y'all built that into your system or have you yet, or do you have plans to kind of start to add that at a greater level? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. And, and when the company started in 2016, I, I was introduced to the company in 2016 and 2017, became an advisor and, and, a, and uh, an investor in the company, and then uh, was asked to be on the board, and then eventually joined the company in a full-time capacity in 2019. It pulled you in. You couldn't stay pulled away. Me in, pulled <laughs> me in. I was, in, I was, uh, I was uh, at Loan Depot, the, one of the largest lenders in the country, as the CEO of their sister company called Mellow Home. Uh, oh, so wow. Okay. Spent a year and a half in the, on your side of the, of the business. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's funny, I tell people I learned more, but being inside a mortgage company, I learned more about the mortgage industry in a year and a half than I had in 30 years of dealing with mortgage companies every day. Um, yeah. Once you pull the curtain behind or pull the curtain back and you see the the wizard working in uh, in his little cave back there, you get an idea of how, how all this stuff kind of fits together. And it's, it's, uh, it's managed chaos. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's well, a lot of, it, yeah, of especially when it's being done at scale, like some of these, yes. some of these really large companies have. Um, how did we get off on that tangent? <laughs> you, you were talking about um, adding AI and when you joined the company. Oh yeah. So when, the, so when I first got involved with the company, that's <laughs> we timing's everything. Um, we were probably ahead of our time because we actually developed and had a lot of patents around artificial intelligence and a artificially intelligent real estate assistant or advisor um, via SMS. So it was, mm -hmm. um, a chat bot on steroids yeah. where, where consumers could interact with Ojo and in real time, get responses, have conversational AI. And if the machine, if the machine couldn't understand the word or the phrase or the question, then that immediately went to a, a human that could jump in and, and help that. And all the while the machine would be learning. And then we used it also, we used AI early on for, for, um, uh, on image recognition on photos and, and attributes of the home where we were able to have a over 1300 different attributes of, of any home that someone could search by like anything as obscure as um, uh, I have shower, like pictures shower curtains like yeah. I, I have to have a house with shower curtains I don't like shower yeah. like or the opposite right, um, right. where we could I, we could because of understanding the images, be able to pull properties and show someone just the properties with the attributes they were looking for. And this was how long ago? This was in, um, you know, 2017, 18, 19. Um, wow. and, then, long way since um, then. and then in 2020, when we bought Movoto.com, uh, we, uh, without going into all the details, things happened very quickly. And, and the, at the time that we bought Movoto.com, all the all the consumers they were generating on their site were being sold to it to a competitor and when we bought them that that stopped and now we had all these consumers so we immediately had to, to sort of change our focus on what we were doing and build uh, all the piping and and the processes and the technology to be able to take those consumers and and interview them to the right excuse me and introduce them to the right agent at the right time and that took uh, all our all our attention, all our effort, and we continue to spend all our time on that. So uh, the acquisition sort of pulled us away from what we were focused on early on, put us on a different path. Um, wouldn't change anything. Uh, sure. but it's just it's just interesting that the the timing um, was uh, the way it, the way that it turned out. And so, so since then, quite, so Matt, Mike, answering your quick question. So we still use. AI and machine learning in a lot of ways. Um, most of those are behind the scenes where the consumer doesn't necessarily uh, understand that, you know, that we learn from what they're doing and then are able to serve them up uh, things so that we use it in assessing how effective the agents and the teams are and, and how we match the, again, the, the, the consumer with the right agent and the right at the right time. 
So if you were if you were starting your own real estate brokerage today, and with all the tools that you know that are out there available to to um, an individual agent or even a, a team, um, what do you feel like is the most essential pieces that you need to have, you know, in order to truly build your business and um, be able to touch as many people as possible? What what, what would you focus on? Um, there's not it's not just one thing, right? Because you need you need the connected pieces to, right. to, you know, it's like a, um, you know, it's like a, like any piece of machinery, right? It's, you can't just have the, the gears, you, you know, you need the crankshaft and, you know, and, and the fuel and, and everything else. So, you know, the, the, the pieces that you have to have, whether you're an agent team brokerage, you have to have the database, right? You have to have that CRM that has the right type of functionality for what you're going to do or how you're going to operate your business. So, so that you can, um, you know, market to those people in an effective way and, and use it to build new relationships also. And then marketing is the other piece, right? You have to have a marketing platform so that you're able to del deliver things of value, right? It used to be all you had to do was stay in touch with, with your, right. your consumers, right? But now um, they're getting, we all are getting just completely inundated with information and offerings all the time. Yep. And in our industry, there's more and more options for consumers than there's ever been before. Different yep. ways of buying a home, different ways of selling homes. Uh, and so as, as an agent, if you want to stay relevant, you have to be able to offer them things of value. And you need to be the ones that are delivering those new things and those new options to them. Because if not, they're going to get it somewhere else. Right. So being able to market effectively and market, market things of value is another key piece. Transaction management is also a necessary function, right? We have to be able to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, those are sort of like the three core components that you needed yesterday, you need them today, you're going to need them tomorrow. Yes. What about, so on the database side of things again, I, I often find, you know, when I talk to folks about database management and how to use it, that they get overwhelmed because these these CRMs these days have so many bells and whistles and so many things that you can do within within them. And, you know, if there's a hundred percent, you know, usage in there, you might actually be able to utilize you know, 5% of what they're actually what they're actually capable of, most agents at least. So how do you get around that or how do you make that a focus to where you can fully utilize because a lot of these tech tools they come with so many things that it's it's difficult and almost overwhelming for people sometimes to be able to fully understand all the uses that are available to them so what's a shortcut or how, how do you get around that problem so you can use those those tools to the greatest you know to their fullest ability yeah so it's um I think that I think what you're describing is completely accurate. And I think it's a function of agents not knowing what they should do and rather think, you know, wondering or asking, you know, what what can they do or what can't because there's there's a, a large number of ways to do that. I was gonna say an infinite, but I don't think it's infinite. There's probably a finite number, but sure. there is a large number of ways of doing things. All right? right. And 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 you know, it's just I my advice to any agent is like figure out what you want to do like it might be as simple as hey i want to i want to email the people that know me twice a month i want to leave them a voice message once a month i want to send them a, a letter once a month i want to like here's the things you i, I want to do to save your system that's a system you gotta that's build it system. Yeah. You divide the system. and then you then you figure out how to make that that the technology do those things for you and the right. good news is Almost every CRM does all those things. You don't need yeah. it to do everything. You need to do the things that you want it to do. Right. Now, once you've mastered that and you've set that up, you know, then you can start adding on, you know, additional things or, or utilize more functionality. But it's not about um, whether you're using 5% of it or 95% of it. It's whether you're, you're using it for 100% of the things that you want it to do right. that, it, that you, you determine that you need to do to stay relevant, to stay top of mind, to stay ahead of, you know, uh, uh, expectations and, and deliver, you know, a lot of value. Right. And then, you know, and then you can, because like to your point, you can get lost in it, right? There's just yeah. so much functionality, but you don't need to know all the functionality. You just need to know how to do the things you want to do. That's why when people ask me, well, what's the best CRM or what CRM should I use? You know, my, my two answers are always the same. 
whichever one you're going to use right. is the most <laughs> yes. important. Yeah. Yes. And then yes. the way, second is the one that has that is most intuitive. It has the simplest functionality for the things you're going to use it for. Yeah. Right? If you're not going to, you know, create blog posts and 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 post those all over the place, then one that has that functionality shouldn't be part of the decision process, right? It's yeah. because you're not going to use it for that. Uh, if you yeah. are going to use it for that, then you look at the ones, which ones do that the best, which ones are to do that with the least amount of effort. Right. Yeah. It's like getting in your car with a map in front of you and going, I can go anywhere, but <laughs> you got to have a place that you're trying to get to in order to get the right road to get to the path where you're trying to go. So that's the importance, like we said in the beginning of creating processes and systems that are going to operate your day and sitting down and actually thinking about it. And I think, I think that's probably one of the biggest disconnects for people is that we spend, we're, we're all busy, right? Everybody's busy 24 seven. You wake up, you've got phone calls to make, you've got kids to take to school, you've got, you know, uh, meetings to go to, you've got work to accomplish or whatever. And you don't carve out an hour or two or, or however long it takes to actually plan what you're going to do. You, most people just let their day plan it for them. You know, it's like as the fires come, we put out the fires and then we look up and we're like, what did I actually get accomplished? And you have these thoughts in your head of something that you want to do, but you never actually get to it. You look up a year later and you're like, I did, I never did that thing because you didn't sit down and go, okay, I got to come up with a plan that I can execute in order to make this happen. And without that piece of it, you get lost in the minutia of your day and your day sets, you know, everything that you're going to do. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of the precise reasons why our lever agents like being part of our com that community so much is because we take a lot of those decisions out of their, you know, out of their hands. Right. So, because we set that up for them and we get that running on their behalf. Um, so they're not, they're not thinking about those things. And the other thing too, is just that decisions, right? A lot of times agents spend a inordinate amount of time deciding what they're going to do, what should they do? What shouldn't they do instead of just having a plan where you're not even having to make those decisions? Yeah. And uh, they don't have to reinvent the wheel because you got some some plans already laid out for them already. Yeah. That's always incredibly helpful. Um, <clears throat> on the marketing side of things, um, what are where do you think the, you know, and, and everybody's different, right? I don't think there's a one size fits all uh, marketing strategy because it all depends on your personality and your book of business and, you know, your location, all those things. But just from a general, you know, point of view, where do you feel like, you know, agents are going to spend, get the most bang for their time focusing on certain marketing activities, especially these days with the advent of social media, AI, you know, all of the, all of the opportunities available to you. You know, I'm, I'm a, I've been talking a lot lately about, you know, getting back into the mailbox because, you know, the key sometimes to marketing is going where other people aren't. And yeah. you know, back when, you know, 20 years ago, you would open up your mailbox and you'd pull out a stack this huge and it all gets thrown away. Today I go to my mailbox and some days I got nothing and other days I've got, you know, two or three things. So where do you feel like from, you know, you've been running companies for years, you know, this is, this is what you do. Where do you feel like is, is the a good place to be as far as your marketing efforts? So I'll, I'll answer that two different ways. One is like the, the tangible things and the tangible things are, yeah, to your point, like we see pendulum swing, you know, from one extreme to the other, right? Like yep. um, there was a time where everyone was door knocking and then uh, no one's door knocking. They're all uh, calling. And then we see calling's not being effective. So now everyone goes to texting and then, and then, yeah, then they go back to door knocking. And so it's, it's, you know, in your area, just looking at, yeah. Um, something that I, that I really focused on early on in my career was, was, and I forget where I heard it or who, who taught it to me. It certainly wasn't an original idea of mine, but it was the 180 degree rule. Just look at what most of the people are doing and do the exact opposite. And that served me really well um, because let's face it, most of the agents weren't succeeding at a high, high, high level. Um, right. So why would I want to do what they were doing? If I felt if I did the opposite, I'd probably, um, fare a lot better. And, and sure enough, that happened. So, you know, in your given area, just look at what's, what everyone else is doing and then say, okay, well, do I want to be just like everyone else or do I want to try to differentiate myself and do something different? So, you know, the tangible things, you know, are if you're marketing um, and understand who you're marketing to. So if you're right. marketing to the people that know you or the people you know, and you're looking for repeat referral or, or first time business from them, then you better be doing something other than just staying in front of them. You, you, that used to work. 
that's mm -hmm. not sufficient anymore. You need to be delivering things of value, right? Okay. So you better be marketing. Your marketing better be of value to the, the person who's consuming that marketing. And then the other, if you're, if you're, um, you know, doing it to, to, for net new business or net new to build net new relationships, then it's, you know, then you need to be delivering value, um, but need to, to be doing it to people that you don't know yet and that don't know you. And, you know, you want to go to where there, there's the most, um, the biggest concentration of them. And that's going to be on social media, right? On TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you know, the, the, the platforms where they're at. And so, you know, having having interesting or valuable information, if you and you don't have to um, you don't have to be a genius to figure any of this stuff out. Right. You just right. just watch, you know, like, look, what are the things that you look at? Who are the people that you follow? You know, there's it might be someone you follow someone who's talks about their gardening and then you're intrigued with how they they grow things. Well, they're offering you something of value, something of interest to you. Right. Yeah. Now, as a as a real estate professional or a mortgage professional, you know, what can you offer of value? Well, as a consumer, I can get a lot of information, you know, by just going to Google or asking mm -hmm. out, you know, Chat GPT. Um, but I'm probably not going to be able to get specific information on a specific neighborhood or a street or a part of town or the, the you know what's going on in that area you know yeah. which which direction are things going are they on the you know the upswing or on the you know on, on a downward trend like that's information that that consumers will find and do find very very interesting right because they can't they can't ask and get a you know i can't i can't go to google and say hey i'm looking at these two areas of this town you know which one's better yeah well, that's the value of niche marketing, which I think, you know, especially it's like these days with the glut of information that's available to consumers, the amount of information that people can find, the more specific that you can get on what it is, the, the message that you're trying to convey about this neighborhood, this street, this city, or, you know, this small business or whatever the case may be. You, you can actually get a pretty good audience from that because there is, you know, we have 300 some odd people, 300 some odd million people in the United States. There is, there's a, there's a hundred thousand people out there looking for that specific thing that you're putting out there. And when you try to be all things to everyone, you're usually nothing to anyone. And so yeah. if you can get specific and you can find something that you're passionate about, that you understand that you have knowledge base, that's above maybe your competition that you understand a little bit better and really drive in and focus on that you can always grow your audience from there but you know i'm a big proponent of starting somewhere very specific and getting an audience built for that and then you can grow beyond that and so you know especially when it comes to social media because there is so much out there you know if you're just filming house walkthroughs and you know neighborhoods and giving price i mean it, you know those are a dime a dozen out there but if you're talking about you know you, you know how bathrooms look and the design aspect of a bathroom and you know where you should put the toilet and the mirror and the countertop and you know the 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 shower and and how it functions and all that can be a very specific thing that people will look for when they're designing homes, they find you and then they can follow you from there. So I think being as specific as possible in your marketing is, is a big benefit, especially if you're looking to gain eyeballs. Yeah, totally agree. Um, how do you feel like, uh, you know, with all this technology that's available, you know, what's your advice to agents that are like, okay, I want to use the tech, but I got to keep my personal touch there because that's what's built my business. So how does someone balance those two things? I, I think if you're, um, un unless you're uh, completely just plagiarizing things or leveraging, you know, AI a hundred percent, it's not easy. It's not, it's not hard to keep your personal touch, right? You, you have to insert yourself into everything you're doing, right? right? You need to have put it into your, your words. You need to talk the way you talk, you need to act the way you act. Um, and so I think that's just, you know, if you're not taking a shortcut and just doing things the right way, I don't think you need to be worried about that because it'll naturally happen if, if you're the one, you know, that's, that's doing that. Like I use AI all the time. I use it for helping me with certain responses to emails or, or certain things I need to, to crop, but I always then put it into my words. Like if I, if it sure. says something that I would never say, I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to. It's like an inspiration. It gives you. Uh, you're yeah. looking for a way to put it. It's like gives, gives you a couple ideas. Like, oh, me, okay. Yeah, it gives me eighty percent of it, and then I, yeah, you know, then I put the finish. Put your own spin. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, talk to you a little bit about all this NAR stuff that's going on. Obviously, um, it's a you know it's been all the all the news uh, rage in the news in the real estate world over the last uh, twelve months, essentially. So, um, you know, I, I, everything is starting to settle in, which is a good thing. I think the for a period of time we were living in a world where nobody knew exactly what was going to happen, and there was a lot of confusion and doubt as to how it's all going to turn out. And I think that's kind of starting to we're kind of starting to see there a clearer picture of, of what it's going to look like, you know, going forward in our new reality here. Um, I want to kind of get your take on, you know, how all this shook out, you know, what you feel like, where you feel like this is headed ultimately, how you feel like it impacts the individual agent. And if you were, you know, with, with your team, where are you telling them to focus their efforts on, you know, going forward, adapting to the, to the new market? Um, <clears throat> I, it's going, it's, it's going to change things. You know, hands down, right? There's changes on starting August 17th. The, right. How how we do things will be different. The um, boy, you asked a bunch of questions in one day. <laughs> so the um, the uh, and and I think from my perspective, I think it's all good. Right? I don't I don't look at this as you know, oh this is bad. This you know. Is it all good for the consumer? Mm, that's debatable. Yeah, you know, right. I think the, I think the plaintiffs' attorneys, and the arguments they made on behalf of the consumers and 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 what they really wanted were two different things. You know, yeah. and um, so did I I'm see not, right? I thought I saw somewhere that all the jurors, um, that there wasn't one person that actually owned a home on the jury. Is that is that true? I, I don't. I can't. I don't know that to be a fact, so I can't tell you it's true or not true. But it yeah. wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, it, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about that trial that is like, <laughs> really? Um, yeah. but in any case, it's what's done is done and, yes. you know, the, the settlements are, are on their way to being approved and things will, will go into play. So a lot of the stuff we've talked about in, in this conversation are just going to matter that much more. Right. right, like being able to deliver value, be able to communicate value, be able to be confident in in your ability to deliver value are going to be key to getting someone to say yes, I want you to be my agent. Yes, I'm I'm willing to pay for your services because I see I'm going to get you know that I want those services. Right? Yeah. It's no different than you know every year my accountant sends me you know an engagement letter that I have to sign every year, like. You know, year after year, here's our rates. Sometimes those rates go up. Um, yep. You know, here's what we do. Here's what we don't do. And I sign it because I get value from from the relationship. Now, the right. minute I stop getting value, I'm I'm going to go find someone else or or go do it a different way. Um, I've never hired an attorney without a retainer. You know, and, and, a, and a retaining agreement. Right? They they that's how the world operates. And and we would never think to list someone's home as agents without a, without a contract, without a listing right. agreement. Yeah. We should have been doing that all along on the buy side. And in right. some states, they have been doing that all along. Um, so for the rest of the states and the rest of the agents, now you have to do that, which then means it's not just, okay, getting someone to sign an agreement, but why should they? Right. You know, what do you do? What are you going to offer that's unique or different or, or valuable to them? And can you communicate that in an effective way? So <clears throat> we're going to see, I, I mentioned, I said this yesterday, the gap between the haves and the have-nots will get wider than they've ever been. And in real estate, the haves are <clears throat> the agents that are skilled, that are experienced, they're doing lots of business. And the have-nots are the ones that aren't. Yeah. And the ones that aren't are going to struggle. They're going to struggle having those conversations. <clears throat> when I'm, a, as a buyer, when I say, well, why you know, why should I sign with you instead of someone else? If you can't give me a good answer that's that with conviction and confidence that makes sense and, and goes, all right, yeah, I want that. Then I'm going to say, all right, well, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll let you know what I decide. And yeah. I'm going to talk to someone else yeah. until I find the one that says, yes, this is the one I want. 
Yeah, you're not walking away from that conversation feeling great about that if that person can't relay exactly what they're doing for you. Where where do you think, um, you know, it, I think the the market's ultimately going to determine this to some extent. And, you know, Zillow's taken a shot at it recently with their buyer rep agreement that they put out there, which is like the the short term thing. But what do you see the evolution of the buyer's rep agreement becoming, you know, with these new changes being that, you know, if anybody doesn't know, you know, if you put on your buyer's rep agreement that your commission or your pay is say 1% because you're trying to not scare somebody away with a cost. And then you go to a seller and you put a contract in and they're offering 3%. Well, sorry, you don't get it. You get one uh, yeah. because that's what's on your agreement. So where do you, what do you think the evolution of that looks like? No, I think there's for a while, there's just going to be, it's just going to be chaotic, right? Cause everyone's yes. going to be trying different things. And there's, um, in, in an industry that is made up of a bunch of independent contractors, you know, there's going to be you, every, every conceivable thing that could be offered or done will be offered or done. And so we'll see all sorts of things. And then over time, we'll see what actually is working and what's sustainable and what makes sense. And then things will calm down and there'll be more of a normalization of, of what's being done. But I think at first it'll just be a lot, it'll be very chaotic. The, um, as far as the agreements themselves go, I think it's going to be, um, I think there's going to be, um, again, a lot of different things tried. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're going to have short-term agreements. You're going to have medium-term agreements. You're going to have long-term agreements. You're going to have agreements for a very, very minor, finite amount of time or finite amount of properties because people are going to want to, they're going to want to date before they get married or you know depend on who it is you're meeting with like if you're meeting with someone for the first time or it's a blind date like when if at mavoto if we're introducing a buyer or a seller to an agent and they don't know each other um and yes we tell the seller that uh, all of our agents are vetted they're the most experienced the most professional that they get the best results that gives the sellers or the buyer some confidence in who they're going to be introduced to but you know it doesn't mean they're going to like them or or right. want to do business with them so you know that may be that may mean an agreement that allows them at least to meet or to have a uh, to be able to date for a while before they decide to get into a relationship and then to get married and yeah. i think the agreements will reflect that that type of process yeah they're gonna have to have some sort of a dating your realtor app where you <laughs> swipe right or whatever that's gonna be necessary for for this going forward. Um, well, and, well, and you know, the good news is, is that most, most real estate relationships are established with someone that you generally already know to some extent or been at a warm referral. So there's a relationship there, you know, to begin with. And then it's just a matter of, you know, setting the parameters of that relationship going into transaction and seeing where that, you know, ultimately takes you. And I think that'll be, that's good. I, I think that's good for the industry. It's transparency, it's communication. I don't think any of that is bad. I think that's a that's a oh, positive raises, thing. Raises the bar of, of professionalism. Yes. That, that's what good agents and brokers and teams have been wanting that for years. You know, they've yeah. been they've been saying, hey, it's there's too many agents. There's too many the bad agents make it hard for the good agents. There's two the, the there's no barriers to entry, all those things. Um, I think these changes will actually for the first time address some of those some of those things that people have been asking for um last thing i want to get from you before you go is um i want to get your opinion on the state of the housing market as a whole because so i read a statistic the other day um talking about different generations boomers gen x which i'm a part of millennials um and you know millennials by the time they got to 30 only 41% of them were homeowners, whereas boomers, by the time they got to 30, 52% were homeowners and 48 of Gen X. So there was a fall off, but it wasn't dramatic. And then we see this massive fall off down to millennials. And I anticipate even a bigger one as we get into Gen Z. So, um, you know, with, with home prices becoming so incredibly unaffordable, you know, with with the market being in the free money, basically, that was just given out for the last five years and interest rates being so low and causing all these asset prices to go through the roof. What do you think or how do we get our way out of this? Is there a solution? You know, what what is our market going to look like in in 15 or 20 years? Are we are we getting to a place where home ownership is only going to be something for the uber wealthy or, or where are we headed? The um, um you know, like if I if I knew the answer to these questions with certainty, I um, I'd quit my day job and place all the bets that I need to right. bet. Um, so that's my disclaimer. 
Yes. The, um, I don't think there's any going back, right? There's not, you know, how are they going to get things back to this way or back to that way? There's no going back, right? Things are, things are moving forward. They're evolving. They're changing. Uh, how people work. The, the younger, you know, the younger generations aren't looking at homes the way, same way that I looked at homes when I was their age or that you did it when you were their age, right? You, when I looked at like, this is where I'm going to live. This is where my job is. This is where right. now people are like, Hey, I could work from here or I could work from there or I could work yeah. from anywhere or, yeah. you know, and because of that, do I want to be nailed down? Do I want to have that? Um, so there's a combination of, you know, uh, uh, human behavior and, and, and how behavior is changing. And then, then there's the real issue of affordability, which is yeah. the other big challenge. So your question was kind of a leading question, but yes, I do believe in the future, there is going to be just like in, in the uh, number of transactions that agents do, the haves and the have nots. I, I unfortunately believe the same thing will happen for, you know, the, the people in this country that, the gap between the haves and the have nots will continue to, to widen and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, home ownership and owning real estate is, is, you know, the biggest, the biggest investment people make. And if they can't, if they don't have the ability to do that, they just, they don't do that. So, yeah. um, will there be things to address it? Yes. Will they help? Yes. But, uh, you know, unless there's some big resets, which would be really painful, when I talk about a big reset, I mean like values coming down 20%. Yes. Um, we've had that happen before and it is very painful. There are a lot of casualties when that happens. Uh, so, and so I'm not, I'm not saying that needs to happen or should happen or I want that to happen, but without that happening, affordability and the affordability challenges aren't going to go away. Right. right. We, um, the you know wages just aren't going to aren't going to keep up with that if they did i would shudder to think what our inflation would look like um so yeah i think as time goes on it's going to be more and more challenging uh for people to to own things um and that's why you know i, I i've always had this conversation with people like if you're going to buy um you know there's never a better time than right now yep. because no one knows what the future is going to look like and good chance it's going to be more expensive or, or more challenging than, than it is now. Yep. That's uh, the, the statement I, when people say is, is when's the best time to buy real estate, I always say yesterday <laughs> because that's just what it is. And, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a doom and gloom thing. You don't try to be that way with it, but it is just the reality of the situation. And in order to, you know, when you're running a business like you have, you know, multiple times over, you have to look at the realities. You can't, well, we hope this and we really want that. I mean, because that doesn't get you what to your end goal. You have to know what's happening, what's what's coming your way and plan accordingly. And that's just a message that you have to give to your clients if you're a real estate professional is like, look, Real estate is becoming something that is getting more and more unaffordable. And if you have the means, and, the, and, and not everybody does, and it's easy to say, but if yeah. you have the means, the ability, you, you, you need to buy, regardless of where interest rates are, because rates change. They change all the time, right? Yeah. And we'll, we'll get, to, I don't think we'll ever get back to the, the two to 3%. I mean, because it was so artificial. Um, I don't see that, but getting back to fours and fives, I don't think is unreasonable. And that's a, that's a very affordable rate for, to, to own a home. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's a rate at which it makes sense. To yes. own a home, right. Um, so, but yeah, the costs are coming down. The prices are going to continue to go up. We've had the slowest real estate market that we've seen in 40 years over the last 12 months. And home prices across the United States still went up 5%. Yeah. yeah. So, doesn't change it. But, all right, Chris. Well, I really appreciate your time, man. Uh, it was a great conversation. Um, I really, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of big tools out there that that agents can use these days to kind of streamline and and with fewer transactions happening, having the ability to make your business more cost effective and more, um, you know, process and system oriented. So that way you can serve the 
the most amount of clients and maximize your income with what you with the tools you have available, I think is invaluable. And, and you guys have created a great product. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm always cheering for the I hope the guy in fifth place comes up and beats, you know, the, the homes.com and the Zillas of the world. So, you know, I'm rooting for you guys. I hope y'all can keep climbing that ladder because um, having good people that have been in the business and are real estate professionals and not the tech guys and the hedge funds, you know, those are the ones that we want leading the industry. And, and you guys are doing a great job with that. Uh, Mike, I really appreciate it. And that's, that's how we feel too. So it's unanimous. Um, let everybody know uh, again, how to find you guys. And then I'll also include a lot of that in the show notes. So if they want to yeah. uh, go check out your site and, and see where you're at. Yeah. If you're, if you're a solo agent, you can go to lever by uh, for uh, uh, teams and go, um, um, <clears throat> Uh, just go, you can go to mavoto.com or ojo.com. Uh, ojo.com is probably the easiest. Or you can just message me. You can find me on any social media platform, DM yep. me, message me. Um, happy He's out there, happy incredibly to accessible. That's how we got him on here. So um, thank you, Chris. I appreciate your time, man. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. Enjoy the playoff runs. Watch a little baseball. Have some good times. And we'll see you guys back here on our market update on Tuesday. So y'all have a great weekend. We'll see you then.